Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Thank you again for being with us. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here for Oregon Voters Digest. Hi, we got quite a show today, and we're going to start off with the fact that, uh, as you know, uh, we got an election coming up here. We got a number of candidates here in the state of Oregon, and we're going to try to interview all of them for that matter. We've got issues. We've got some major issues that are facing us here in the state of Oregon, and more specifically here in the, in the city of Portland and, and elsewhere. But we're going to start out, we can sort of give you an example of what we're going to be doing. We, we just happen to have a candidate, a person who's going to be running for one of the highest seats here in the state of Oregon, one of our U.S. Senators' seat, a gentleman by the name of Mark Callahan. In fact, this is your second time, right? This is my second time running for U.S. Senate. Yes. Second time for U.S. Senate, and we're going to meet, meet Mark. Mark, why, why, should, why are you running, and why should, why should the voters vote for you? Well, I figure I, I, did, I, did, uh, I established a pretty good... Um, idea of how to do it last time. Okay. Um, I was uh, one of the five Republican candidates prior to the May 2014 primary that was running and um, I didn't make it through the primary but so I thought I'd give it another shot. I'm not the type of person to give up and uh, I, I just got to keep on in there and keep on going. So How'd you fare out? Uh, in the primary I got about 18,709 votes um, and uh, support from all over Oregon and uh, all over the country for that, for that matter uh, regarding that uh, Willamette Week blah 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 video that went viral mm -hmm. uh, got a couple spots on Fox News regarding that but um, yeah to give it another shot I just can't sit on the couch watch TV and complain anymore I just have to get out there and actually continue to do something about what I'm seeing and what mm -hmm. I'm seeing here is that Senator Ron Wyden is not serving Oregon's needs mm -hmm. Oregon's needs jobs and he seems to want to live in New York most of the time mm -hmm. so I'm running for U.S. Senate because I want to be Oregon's second senator, not New York's third. Good, good. So. I take it the, the issue then is jobs for you, right? Exactly, so, exactly. So how, so how are we going to how are you going to generate jobs? Well, I mean, I know that uh, we need to get back to the forests. We need to get our land back. For one, when you see all these forest fires all throughout Oregon that are causing all these all the smoke and stuff like that in the metro area here in the last couple weeks, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, why are we letting the forest burn? as opposed to actually getting people in the forest, harvesting the forest, creating uh, solid, positive economies, and, and money for our schools, and our money for our local economy, mm -hmm. it is. Instead, we're just letting the trees burn, and that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you, well, you know, from the same, we got a presidential race right now, and that's, that's the hottest thing going. Exactly. Uh, with Donald Trump, right? <laughs> Donald to Donald. Anyway, but uh, he, he bring out a couple of issues that's pretty well major, pretty well dictate basically what these guys, how they respond. Immigration was one of these. How do you feel about that for Oregon? Well, um, I, I kind of have to uh, give a little bit of a disclosure. I'm on the Oregonians for Immigration Reform Board, so I was one of the uh, people that was fighting against the uh, driver's license for illegals in the last election, I was against Measure 88. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, just a disclosure. But uh, I, I believe that if you're going to be here in this country, you need to be here legally. Mm -hmm. And you need to follow the laws. By breaking into the country in the first place, you're not following the country's laws and you're not here legally. So as long as you're here legally, then fine. You can be here. You can find a job, do whatever you want to do to, in terms of becoming an American mm -hmm. and wanting to be an American. But you got to start. You got to follow the law first and foremost. We are a nation of laws. Okay. Many employers are breaking the law too, they, as far as uh, E-Verify. What do you feel about E-Verify? You oh, think we're doing the war? Oh, E-Verify is a is a is a federal program, right. a free federal program where you go on the website and you input the information to make sure the person can actually legally work in the United States. I mean, it's it's you just go to the website. It's Are all they you enforcing do. it what, as far as employers? I mean, immigration laws nationwide aren't being enforced, mm -hmm. and so, including E-Verify. I mean, some people participate in it voluntarily, but right now we OFER actually Oregon for Immigration Reform actually has a couple ballot measures coming up here. We're trying to gather signatures for, mm -hmm. in terms of enforcing E-Verify and also making English the official language of Oregon. Well, the other heated subject is the uh, the Planned Parenthood piece. Well, it looks like uh, the Congress and whatever, they, they're voting on this issue right now. It's going to be going to the president. Yeah, what do you heard, think about that? What well, do you I, heard, about? I heard it went through the House, okay. and the House did uh, a good job in terms of actually um, preventing abortions to some extent mm -hmm. anyway. Um, the Senate, I, I don't know. I mean, it's... I, I, I'm pro-life or pro-life myself, and I believe life begins at conception. And... Um, I have two beautiful daughters myself, they're 11 and 12, and there's no way in the world I could ever would have even crossed my mind in terms of aborting. I wanted them. I, I wanted daughters, and I, I love them very much. And so, as I said, I, I'm pro-life, but I don't think we're going to win on the social issues, at least Republicans here in Oregon. We need to concentrate on the, fo on the economic issues instead. What so. would be your solution to this issue? In terms of uh, solving this problem, you got you got two uh, two entities here. 
So, I mean, like the versus the the pro life versus pro choice debate. Right. Is that what right. you're talking what about? Do you think, real quick, right? Well, I mean, honestly, I don't have a. As I said, I don't. Have, I'm not focusing on the social issues okay. right now. I, I I know where I stand. I'm pro life. Life begins at conception. Okay. My opinion. So right. I'm good. a Christian myself. So sound good for you. There you have it. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. We're going to be in, be in, in, in view, interviewing these folks. I'm a little short right now. It's going time. But hey, thank you again, Mark. All right, thank you. Good luck to you. Appreciate okay, it. Bruce. Good enough. Yep. All right now, yep. we're going to go on now. Phil, come on, come on. We're going to have another person that's coming on in right now, and uh, we're going to have Phil. That's how we're going to do this, folks. We're going to just kind of get folks and talk about issues and, and get right down to the meat. I mean, I've, I've known this guy for quite some time. We, we've, been, we've been countered a number of days. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I've got Phil Sanford. Many of you probably recognize him if you've been, in, if you've been around, if you read The Oregonian back in the, in the days when I was there. That's and right. when he was there, I mean, he was, he was right there, and he was really outspoken and a very, very effective, if you will, writer and columnist uh, with the Oregonian. All, then he went to the to the uh, Tribune, right? The Tribune, and that was a great one. The Oregon, the uh, Portland Tribune, and uh, and he was there too, and he was doing his thing, and he was really was one. I, I've always I've always thought about it from the Willamette Week standpoint, you know, like the Tribune had some. It was it was good. I mean, you were the only investigative reporter, as I saw it. Uh, well, uh, we had Jim Redden. Yeah, Jim was there. Very, very good. Yeah, yeah. But you was at the lead. You, you were the lead guy. Yep. I mean, I always read yours first. Well, I, I was a columnist. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was there to Jim's good. bring people in. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, what, good, that's good, what I tried good. to do. Well, look, uh, look, we've got Phil on today because in all due respect, uh, he's a writer now. I mean, he's really, he's really, really a bona fide writer. I just happened to have two of the two of his latest his publications. He's already, he's already published these. I'll put these right in the front of the front of the camera here. I think you can see those right in front of me. Uh, this is the first one. Let's see the first one. You just go on. Well, the first one is uh, Portland Confidential. Portland that, Confidential. That, that came out about 10 years ago. Okay, okay. And that's about Portland back in the payoff days. Okay, when good. You just, all you had to do if you wanted to operate an illegal enterprise in, in, in Portland was to pay off the cops and, oh, and, and wow. they, they would take care of you. Gee, and what about the second issue? Uh, the, the Peyton Allen files. Uh, Larry, uh, Peyton and uh, Beverly Allen, uh, two teenagers, were murdered in 1960. It was uh, Portland's biggest murder case, probably ever. Um, and uh, they they didn't know who did it for years. And, mm -hmm. and finally, and this is the story of uh, of the murder, but the investigation too. After eight years, they picked three guys from Northwest Portland and, and railroaded them for the crime. Oh, oh. Yeah. Do you get any feedback from from these issues? I mean, oh sure, out there? yeah. I mean. I, I, most of the people who really disagree with me don't talk to me. Oh, yeah, they they, oh. they, they don't want to talk to me. But there's a lot of grumbling. There there was a lot of grumbling in the DA's office when mm. I I did both the books. Mm, really? Oh yeah, yeah. They, uh, the the uh, one of my favorite uh, DA characters, Norm Frink, uh, denies to this day that the what I've said in Portland Confidential was yeah. true that there was a payoff. But, oh. <laughs> but I, I I'm not sure he was able to get past the first or second page. Wow, wow. Yeah. Any additions to these at all? Mm -hmm. uh, Later on. There, there will be. Uh, there will be. Yeah, there, there. Uh, uh, I'm going to reissue them at some point with with more information. Okay, good, good, good. Well, okay. Now, first off, give me a, give me a feel of why did you get into this? I mean, you know, you you left the Tribune, right? And now you're, you're just writing. I mean, what, right. what excited you about just getting out of that other business, if you will, into the writing business? Well, it's, it's the same business. Anyway, yeah, right. You okay. know, I, I, okay. writing and writing for uh, people's enjoyment. But yeah. but here is a chance to do obviously more. There are more pages and. A chance to uh, certainly get into a subject at, at, at greater depth. Right, right, right. Portland Confidential is about the payoff system, and there's a lot to to research there. And and of course the the Peyton Allen files. I'm I'm working now on a, a book about the Frankie case, Michael yeah. Frankie murder. And by the way, by the way, we're getting the scoop, folks. We've got the scoop. I mean, I got the scoop here. I mean, <laughs> I got the scoop, if you will. This is going to be an interesting piece. Go on. Uh, about the Frankie case. Well, uh, and for the benefit of uh, some of the most of the people watching this show, right. if they're not of a certain age, probably don't even know about it. It's a murder that happened in 1989, 26 years ago. And why is it important? Uh, well, one of the reasons is that the guy they railroaded for it, who had nothing to do with the, the murder at all, is still sitting in prison doing life without parole. Hmm. Now, it it has uh, his case is finally gotten to uh, the federal court level. The federal public defender filed a habeas corpus petition about almost a year ago now. And, and the AG, uh, Oregon's uh, attorney general, who has to respond to that, has been delaying responding as long as she can. She just a few days ago asked for another delay. 
Hmm. I think the, the next deadline is uh, sometime about the middle of next month. And uh, let's hope that the judge finally puts their feet to the fire here. It, but, uh, but it's it's a very difficult political uh, yeah. situation yeah. for her yeah. uh, because it was a corrupt investigation, it was a corrupt mm -hmm. trial, it was a corrupt prosecution, and of course the, it was the ruling party in this state, this is a one-party state right, essentially, right, right. Uh, has, has to bear some responsibility for that. Uh, Neil Goldschmidt was the governor, he did what he could to resist, uh, uh, to prevent an FBI investigation of the corruption down there, and uh, he, he I, I'm not suggesting he had anything to do with the murder, I don't think mm -hmm. he did, but I think he was very likely being blackmailed by people who did, because at that time he had a, a, a deep dark secret which uh, that he'd been covering up for years that had to do with the, the, a girl uh, he had been um, statutorily <laughs> raping yes, right. she, she started right. when she was 13. Right. It's always hard to pick out, you can't say affair, you can't say relationship right. even though that's a neutral word. Um, uh, from his days as mayor back in the 70s and now that he was governor she was calling him up on the phone getting through his secretary and saying you raped me you owe me mm -hmm. and he was meeting with her trying to calm things down meeting with her lawyers negotiating finally uh, he ended up giving her three hundred thousand some dollars mm -hmm. to sit down and shut up and, and, and she would re continue to receive the money as long as she didn't say anything about it, so it, it did take Willamette Week finally to, to break that out a few years ago. But when this murder happened, uh, uh, Goldschmidt's uh, chief of corrections, it was Michael Frankie, the head of corrections under, under Goldschmidt, who was killed one night. He walked out of his office, 7 o'clock at night, on January night. It was dark, and someone stabbed him in the heart. We don't know, because there was such a bad investigation, because the investigation went everywhere, but, but except towards the, you know, what was indicated. Right. Um, we don't know who did it, but we do know that Michael Frankie at that time was cleaning house. Uh, he had told his brother that he was cleaning house and that, that he was uh, uh, going, shaking things up. Uh, there is a great deal of evidence that he was worried about embezzlement down there, that he was worried about insurance fraud by the people in corrections. And what we do know is that immediately uh, uh, the the people in charge, the DA down there, Dale Penn, mm -hmm. the state cops who were running the investigation, put out the word it was a car, car clout gone bad, right? Knowing what they had to know mm -hmm. about the situation down there, because there'd been another corruption investigation covered up just a couple years before hmm. and they were responsible for covering that up. So you had the, go the governor covering it up, you had the state cops covering it up, you had the DA, they had reasons for covering it up and it was, and, 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 and they picked a patsy finally. Hmm. They, 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 uh, this, this poor guy Frank Gable is a local tweaker, an Indian kid from a, hmm. a very, very broken home hmm. from South hmm. Dakota who'd ended up out here. And uh, they picked him because he was easy. They, hmm. they, they lined up witnesses. There was no physical evidence mm -hmm. against him. Mm -hmm. None. Nothing, mm -hmm. nothing that connected mm -hmm. him. They lined up eight so-called material witnesses, fed them the story, let them know that uh, they could go free on uh, uh, charges that were hanging over mm -hmm. their heads, mm -hmm. and they convicted the guy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. wow. Tell me this. What, what about our, our media during that particular time? How did they handle that particular Well, time? I was part of the media. Yeah, I was, was, yeah, I was yeah. writing a call. Oh, you, you were, oh <laughs> I, I became notorious. Yes, yeah, yes, they, they, yes. Uh, I mean, when, when people write about it now, they, they say I was obsessed with the case, and, and I, I suppose that's fair. But I, I was writing a column for the Oregonian. I, I did, had, had the spot that Steve Dean has now. Yeah, okay. And um, I... I, I knew. My, my gut told me there was something really wrong. You know, mm -hmm. you, three days after the murder, if you don't have a suspect, you can't say it was someone. It was a car burglary going right. bad. And then they start telling more lies. They start, you know, covering up. And so, you know, I could tell by the lies. I was frankly flying by the seat of my pants back then because, you know, you don't know what's going on mm -hmm. in an investigation. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until about ten years later, and I got the complete investigative file. It was like thirty some bankers boxes, and I, I read. It was when I was at the Tribune. Yeah, right, right, right. And read that, and and said, yeah, I was right. They didn't have a case against. They didn't have 
anything against the guy. And so what has happened with the federal public defender has uh, filed this absolutely brilliant brief. There is no doubt about it after you read it, this mm -hmm. habeas corpus petition, that they made up the case against hmm. the guy. She documents it. It's a brilliant bit of work. And, and, uh, and, and you, there, there is really no possibility they did it out of stupidity. They knew what they were doing. But there will be a follow-up now on this piece. Oh, yeah. There, there's, a, there's an attorney. I mean, I guess they're suing the state or something to that well, effect. Well, uh, they are demanding, they're demanding. That, that they either be given a, a, a new trial or they just let him out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you know, you'd mentioned about uh, maybe it's sort of like, uh, I mean, holding things back with the Attorney General's office and whatever. I'm, yeah, it was kind of interesting when you brought that piece up because it, well, it's a, it's a present Attorney General happens to be has a relationship with the Willamette Week and then one of the... the yeah, that's, that's not what, I mean, that, 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 may, that may enter into it somehow, but the, what, what's really important is that Ellen Rosenblum yeah, right. was, got her first uh, 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 judgeship from Neil Goldschmidt. So she's beholden to him mm. and to that Democratic establishment. Mm. Uh, Dale Penn was rewarded for keeping the lid on. He was the, he was the DA down there, and they, so they rewarded him by putting him in charge of the lottery. Yes, Can you imagine I the purse settlement you get out of Gee. that? And now he's a judge. Gee. Okay, so but they've got to what she's got to acknowledge here is the utter corruption of that investigation and the corruption of the cover up that that. Uh, that, that was clamped down immediately. But what about the rest of the media? Aren't they familiar with the status of the case? I mean, did, didn't they get the announcement uh, about uh, this issue or what? Well, well I mean, if, 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 I, if I were writing a column yes, still, yeah. I, I would be out there making a Big fool time. of myself, you know, just yeah, pounding yeah. the table every time. I can't really blame them for not doing it. They, uh, actually, the, the Tribune, uh, Jim Redden did three really good stories. Okay. Nigel Jaquist at Willamette Week yeah, did a really okay, good story. Okay. And, and the Oregonian, bless their heart, did their best, you know, okay. when, when the, the petition was filed. Uh, I can't expect them to keep writing. They, they need a, some sort of news event. And since Rosen, Ellen Rosenblum keeps getting delays, they're, you know, they're... they're yeah. it, but, uh, but that was the, a major the, concern of Oregonians. I mean, that was major stuff. Oh, yeah. I can remember that. Well, it, 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 it's, a, it's serious business when you have a, a high-ranking public official assassinated. Yeah, wow. And it goes back to the people who were running the place. He, had, uh, he was cleaning house. He was letting people go. There, uh, and, and he ended up murdered. What was the hide? What, what, were they, what, was it, what, what were they trying to hide? What were they concerned about? about, about, about the, what was the major concern about well, they, that he was doing? They, they, their, their major concern is that they would have gone to jail, you know, for ta you know, uh, the money they were taken out of the, uh, different programs, uh, cattle they were selling, heavy equipment they were selling. Uh, there was insurance for a, a uh, in in 1988. Frankie had already, had been there for a better part of a year. Uh, they, a shed where where they manufacture were supposedly manufacturing furniture and things like that mm -hmm. just outside the prison, burned down and they claimed like one point uh, two million dollars in insurance. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything in it, any you know. And, and, and Frankie was onto that. The day after he uh, he was killed, he was supposed to appear before the legislature. He was going to talk about the a shed fire. And. Uh, Public officials go to go to prison for, for doing that sort of thing, you know, hmm. if that was proved. So what happened eventually is that Goldschmidt created a commission that raised certain issues, and then the whole thing was kicked to the state police, who were in on the cover-up anyway, and they dismissed it. They they said there was no cr nothing wrong, uh, nothing amiss with the A shed fire. The, the ombudsman down there, who got no coverage at all, said yes, there there is something really wrong here, and and somehow that never got any attention. Mm -hmm. that, that never got any attention. But so they were worried that they would be exposed and there's nothing more dangerous than a dirty public official mm -hmm. or, or a, a dirty cop. Mm -hmm. They have too much to lose mm -hmm. and they're going to get caught. What do you, what, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, in terms of, you're going to be writing this book, you're going to be doing all the research and whatever. Right. How do you think Oregonian is going to receive this, this, this particular time? You mean the, the newspaper? Yeah. Oh, what do you think? I, I wouldn't want to predict. You know, I've got friends there, and I, 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 I don't think they, they could even deny anymore that they did a terrible job of the news coverage of the, of, of the Frankie murder. Hmm. They did. They, they were completely, t 
sucked in by the, the, whatever the, uh, the prosecution was telling them, whatever right. the state cops. Right. They, they had some fairly inadequate reporters assigned to it, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the Salem Statesman Journal had a, had a great reporter, Steve Jackson. He, he did a great job on the thing, but people up here didn't get to read it. Mm -hmm. I did my best with the column, right. but I wasn't down there doing research every day, so I was, uh, you know, I, I was playing catch up, and, um, and if I couldn't think of anything new, I'd just slice it and dice yeah, yeah, it a different yeah, way right, and put right, it out right, again right, right, you know, right, to keep right, it going. Right. But it, to me, it was really an important issue. It still is because a guy is still in prison. They took his life away from wow. him. Life without parole for something he doesn't know anything about. Yeah. Well, hey, I tell you what, we're going to be looking forward. I know myself, and I'm sure the viewing audience are going to be looking forward to you completing this book. When, are you going to, when do you think we're going to get a copy? When is it going to come off the press? It takes a while. I, I'll, I'll finish it probably in about uh, five or six months, and then it, then there's always another six months delay. Okay, will you least. come back here? Uh, it's a deal. Time with us. Bruce. And, and by the way, let me ask you this now. What, what, can, you still, can we still pick copies of this? Uh, where can you pick copies of this? Uh, Powell's for sure. Powell's yeah. for sure? Yeah. Both copies? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And very reasonable. To you, I guess. No problem. Well, hey, thank you very much, my friend. Bruce, thanks all, very much for having me on. Pleasure. Okay, good. My pleasure. And thanks again. Okay, Phil. Yeah. All right, now, we're going on now with, with DuPay, one of your friends, right? Uh, he wrote a book, right? Oh, yeah. He wrote a book. It's, it's a, a very valuable book, too. Yeah, it is, right? Oh, yes. You, you signed off on that book, too, didn't you? You bet I did. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, Phil. Thanks again, Phil. You bet. Okay, bud. Don, come on over here. Okay, now we got Don DuPay. You've seen Don before. He's going. I remember that. But we're really getting it into this. I mean, I mean, it looked like it just kind of dovetailed in some yeah. of the things, some of the concerns <laughs> you've had too, and even in the book, right? Right. Behind the badge in River City, you've seen this before. You've seen Don before. Well, guess what? Uh, he's got some. He, he, he's got some thoughts here. You know, we've been talking about the whole issue of Portland police and the like and whatever. And and in all due respect, there is a major divide uh, between uh, the Portland citizenry and the and police, right? And and, yeah, and, sure and, and the yeah. whole point of, of um, as, as I see it, and, and as I've met and talked with Don about this issue, the behind the, the badge in River City is a very interesting read, a very good reading, a good read, if you will, is that um, it just brings it out the divide. It, it really brings out the divide, yeah. and and uh, and people are a little bit more assertive, you know, from the standpoint of saying like who's running the city. I, I mean, I was sort of like dumbfounded in terms of what that was all about. Yeah. And then you, you, you and then I've talked to a lot of people and and their thing is that yes, well, the mayor doesn't run the city and the city council doesn't run the city, the police run the city. And then and then I come up with some, some thought. We've we've talked about this many much mm -hmm. time over, but based on some of the things that you've made and reading the books and getting that background on the ball, I started thinking about, well, now well, what's what's the role of the police department? And what's the role of the citizenry? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's supposed to be a government of the people, by people, and for the people. It's something that I've always said, if you will. And then I've come up with this deal. Wait a minute. They're not just policemen. They're law enforcement officers. They're laws. Yeah. You know, if a person, if a, if a citizen breaks the law, and guess what? They, they get arrested or whatever. You, you know, you got to suffer the consequences. So they're law enforcement officers. I've got a new, I got a new, new brand now. They're law enforcement officers. Yeah. And we talked about that. And I got that from you. Thanks. Thank so you. let's expand on that now. You know, as you know, we, you and I, you and I, we're about eighty-five percent sure that we may be running for the mayor of the city of Portland. And uh, you're going to be the you're going to be the police chief and the me. liaison, right? You got me. I got you. You even dressed like a detective today. Well, I, thank I like you. that. I like. It's I hard like, to get away from. You got your glasses here, so you yeah. can read your, read the reports and all. I'm feeling good about this piece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So look, Don, you've well, come up with some ideas. Let's talk. Let me, let me say first about Phil Stanford is that is that when my book came out, all the rumors that he was a conspiracy theorist went away, because I proved that he was right. And what, what do you mean? Expand well, on that a little bit all, about this conspiracy. All of, all of the corruption and the crime that he was talking about right. when they called him conspiracy theorist. Where is he? Oh, he's gone right now, right. Uh, it's confirmed in this book. But that was, the, that talked, was kind of the feeling he, around the yeah, department? Yeah, he, he talked about Captain Jim Purcell, okay. you know, being a crook and uh, all about him. On Portland Police. On, on the Portland Police Department, you know, before I ever got to work for the captain. Right. And uh, verified the fact that, yeah, he sure was a crook, so... But during that particular time, everybody was kind of like anti Phil Sanford. You know, well, they were they were looking at him with a jaundiced eye, you mm -hmm. know, because he interviewed me for uh, the first book that he wrote, Portland Confidential. Phil did. Phil did yeah. to get information about some of the corruption that was going on mm -hmm. in Portland. So, huh. well, cool. and then I came along and verified it because I worked for, I worked for the 
most worst of the crop. Yeah, yeah. Might add, might add too, by the way, Don's been here several times. And for those who are new here, you can go to YouTube and you get the full interview and whatever. And also, you can pick, pick a copy down at and you get Power Bookstore and Power Book has it for dinner. sure. Was it, uh, was it got the other one downtown too? Was it uh, the, Powell's uh, Book? St. John's Bookseller okay. has it. Uh, it's available Oregon on Historical Amazon. Historical Society too. I understand the Oregon Historical Society might have it too. Yeah, Oregon, Oregon Historical, Historical Society. Society has yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so. so good. Then. I'll give you a little around. background to pick it up. But if right now, if you don't want to buy it, you can uh, get it from the public library. Now, now, now we're going to be doing now, uh, and, and Don's got down and he's, he's uh, thought about this thing, and, and now he's put together a piece. I think it's a real neat piece, and he's got quite a bit, but we're going to, today we're going to probably spend one area, so, but recognizing uh, the police, a five-year plan, right? Yeah. Tell me how we got that, got to this point. Well, the police department has been accused of being overly militaristic. Right. They've been accused of being uh, the we and us, they, mm -hmm. and that uh, that the city of Portland is run by the police union. So those are the accusations that are going on. Um, I've been a policeman, I was a policeman here for a long time from 1961 to 1978. And I left the police department because the corruption was affecting my health. Mm -hmm. So I'm well aware of the things that they've done wrong I have a really good idea of how some of these things need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is about. If you want to pick, yeah. pick a specific problem. So it's a mix between, it's it, kind of like a then and now. It's exactly and it's going to kind of right. look together, the merging and getting the right. better of both worlds, right. right? One of the things that I think that they should do immediately is to go back to the blue uniforms. Go back to the blue go uniforms. Go back to the blue mm -hmm. uniforms. Uh, right now, they look like a cross between a ninja and a Gestapo. Oh, yeah. And uh, I don't know why they ever went to the black. Well, because it's more intimidating. Mm. The black uniforms are more intimidating. Uh, they have these flak vests. It says police all over there, obviously police, and they're obviously not your friend. Mm. The blue uniforms, uh, w when people talk about, gee, what happened to the police, they always talk about, hey, those guys on Adam-12. Remember that? Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, yeah, they had all nice shiny bill caps, and they were dressed nice, and uh, they didn't have all these flak vests going on. They weren't the Gestapo. Mm -hmm. They were the local friendly police officer. So that's what one of the things that they should do is is get back to the blue uniform, change the appearance. Uh, let, I let me ask you, do you remember the brand that they were using at that time on the cars? You know, is it Portland Finance? I, I, I don't the think that there. The I don't think. It? I don't recall anything on there except the rose yeah, medallion. Right, right, okay, I don't okay. remember a, a symbol or a slogan that they had. Okay, no. Okay. All right. Anyway. Now they have dedicated to serve or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go on. I'm sorry. Go on. So, along with that, uh, going back to a softer uniform and, and a better and a better uh, view of the police. I also would take it one step further in a test program. I would have one team of officers at each precinct that wore slacks and blazers. Like, they would look like detectives, but they would be uh, they would be a regular district officer. And I would be that because that's more softening of the uniform and police work can still get done. I would do that as a, a, a pilot program to see what kind of citizen reaction we got from it. I know they did this in, I think it was San Diego or San Jose, someplace in California a few years ago, mm -hmm. and it worked fine. The only problem with it was the citizens started complaining that well, they never saw a policeman anymore. Mm -hmm. But a lot of police work gets done. That's the thing about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I'd also take some of these cars that are marked cars, and I would repaint them to be unmarked cars because uh, driving around in an in a obviously marked car uh, doesn't help police work any because they know where you are. I can remember when I worked out in St. John's sitting on a stolen car parked two blocks away or a block away waiting for someone to come out and drive it off and I'm sitting here in a black and white police car. How can they not miss me? How can they not see me? So a lot of... Uh, a lot of police work can get done in an unmarked car. So I would reduce the number of marked cars. Uh, I, I would absolutely go back to two-man cars. Two-man? 
two man cars. What's your rationale behind I that? I would never want to, I never want to hear uh, a Portland police officer being injured because I'm waiting for backup. Uh, waiting for backup. It is so, uh, always been, in my opinion, irresponsible because having two one man cars just you got a car that you got to buy mm -hmm. and you get a call over here and so he's going to get cover from the other car and, and in my experience when I worked six years in the Avenue in North Portland and St. John's it was rare that the two officers couldn't handle the situation mm -hmm. and we didn't have to, if we needed backup we got backup but one man car is just is just crying for problems. Do you have any idea about a change? Why they made that change? Well, they think that they're that they're getting more coverage, and they're not really getting more coverage because they've got two cars covering one call. Mm -hmm. So it's always been uh, Maloney in my book nonsense. Uh, two officers properly equipped should be able to handle mm -hmm. most problems they come across. You got most cops that are young out there. I was 25, 26, 27, you know, 28 when I'm down there. Two young guys should be able to handle mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of the problems. What about weapon selection? I think you were talking a little bit about that. About weapon weapons, selection, yes. well. What do you think? I would never require a policeman to carry a semi-automatic pistol. I don't like them. I've never liked them. Uh, there's 19 or 20 videos on YouTube on how to unjam a Glock. Hmm. Hmm. Now, if I'm going to be pulling my gun, the last thing I want to worry about is it having to jam. Hmm. You know, they're fine for military use, perhaps, but I've never seen them as a, as a good weapon for law enforcement. I would give the officers their option. You can carry anything you want, except probably a 44 Magnum, which would be a little too powerful for being around city police work. But. Uh, my favorite gun has always been a 357 Magnum, mm -hmm. which has got plenty of power, and uh, it's a revolver, and I've never heard of a revolver ever jamming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, semi-automatic pistols, if you want to carry a Glock, that'd be up to you, but I wouldn't require you to. Okay. One, th one thing you mentioned also, too, because of the current situation now with the, with the camera, yeah. the video camera, yeah. Yeah, what, what, are you, what are your comments on that? You came up with some ideas. Well... Police officers have always protected themselves. If they don't want to hear a call, they'll turn off the radio. If they don't want something photographed, they'll turn off the dash cam. And if you're going to spend two or three million dollars putting cameras on policemen, if they can turn them off, don't bother your money buying. Don't waste your money buying them. Hmm. Uh, if you're going to put cameras on policemen, they should be turned on by the boss and you're clocked in so that you know you're turned on. And it's now you can't turn it off until you get off shift and you're clocked out. Hmm. And that information should go all right up to a cloud so that nobody can mess with it. That's, that's transparency, Bruce. Mm -hmm. That's what transparency is. If I can turn off the camera, don't bother giving me one mm -hmm. because I will. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the other major relationship uh, and concern, and I've talked to a number of people, and again, I've had concerns, like many, but a lot of folks tend not to want to get into those discussions. The whole issue between the union and the people mm -hmm. through the city council and mayor. Any thoughts about that? You, you've talked a little bit about that. Well, the union president uh, if in my reorganization would either have to decide whether he wanted to be a union president or we don't want to be a police officer mm -hmm. because he is a police officer. He takes up a police officer's spot he gets policemen's pay, and yet he works for the union, and he doesn't do any police work. Hmm. So he gets paid by the union. So that's commonly called double dipping. Mm -hmm. And I would make them decide. I would let them uh, be a union president if that's what they want. I would put them on administrative leave. You don't get any police pay. You don't get any police pension or, or benefits until you decide to come back as a police officer. Mm -hmm. Then you be rehired as a police officer without prejudice mm -hmm. and just go back. No way would I uh, uh, interfere with the union work. That wouldn't be my intention. But you don't do police work, you don't get paid policemen's mm -hmm. pay.
Well, you know, on the other side, uh, many, uh, as I understand, policemen are, are feeling that they're not being taken care of, or they're not. They're, you know, they, they've got to really be. They got to be in charge because yeah. uh, because the, the citizenry is, doesn't understand issues that they're being faced with, being harassed, mm -hmm. uh, being shot at. I mean, all on and on and on and on. Well, how do you how do you respond to that? How do you, how do you how do you make them feel comfortable, if you will? Uh, uh, I'm not sure you're ever going to be comfortable being okay. a policeman. All right. Okay. Because it's a really tough. It's a tough job. That's right. A really tough, tough dangerous, job. dangerous, dangerous job. job. Yeah. Uh, but they talk a lot about transparency that we don't have in the police department, and you have to go past some things that have been going on for a long, long time mm -hmm. to get back to transparency. And transparency, in my opinion, is you have to report to the people who hired you. you know, the union can't get in the way of that. And, that, and then you're talking about internal affairs, which is a, a privately run justice system for the police uh, that insulates police officers from the people that they work for, mm -hmm. the citizens. So I would uh, have a completely different system because internal affairs is a violation of the 14th Amendment really? to the Constitution. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution says equal justice for all. It doesn't say you would have a special justice system if you're a policeman, or if you're an electrician, you get your own, or if you're a plumber, you get your own. No. It says equal justice for all. Well, internal affairs is a private justice system for the police. They decide the cop made a mistake. They uh, act as the judge, and they decide what the penalty is going to be. And it's usually a 30-day suspension or something of that equivalent. Mm -hmm. And so you're taking money away from them, and then uh, you have, you have, uh, you have uh, usurped the, just, the justice system. Mm -hmm. That's completely illegal. I'm pretty sure that it's written into the police contract. So if that's illegal, then their contract is illegal. And there's a couple of ways to attack it. Uh, since it's a federal constitution, 14th Amendment, I would have the city attorney see, uh, see if he could get a federal injunction to stop the police from breaking the 14th Amendment. Uh, that would be a long, probably a long-term process, and the union would be complaining about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, as the administrator, the chief of police, or the mayor, I simply transfer everybody out of internal affairs. Mm -hmm. They just don't work there anymore. Mm -hmm. There is no more internal affairs. Mm -hmm. What about that, tasers? You, you mentioned something about tasers. Tasers, tasers uh, need to go. 680-some people have been killed by tasers since they first started using them. Uh, they're certainly not a less than lethal device. Uh, it's part of the loss of hands-on police work. Uh, you can stand 15 feet away, I can zap that now a man sitting back there behind the camera and never get close to him. Hmm. And I, I could kill him and he's never been convicted of a crime. Hmm. Hmm. So tasers have been declared uh, by Amnesty International as electronic torture devices. They are electronic torture devices. They're a cattle prod with a short handle. Hmm. I'd get rid of them. They wouldn't be allowed to use them. Hmm. Hmm. You they know, need to go. You know, <coughs> one, 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 need now to what go. about staff? You know, you know, we, we talked about deterrent and then you know I mean I remember at one point in time you'd made mention about the fact that, you know, you accepted the whole issue of affirmative action and you know, women and, and little people, this, that and the other, but uh, are we still pretty well firm on that in terms of how you feel about that? You're about the, kind about of the two people in the cars, I mean, they should they should physically look like a, an officer? They should look like an officer, but they shouldn't look like the Gestapo. Okay, yep. okay, okay, that's very important. Or they should look like a couple of detectives. Yes, 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 yes. Obviously yes. policemen, but not obviously soldiers. Okay. Soldiers should look like soldiers. Police officers should look like police officers. Oh, law enforcement officers. Law you, enforcement. You really, you really yeah. pull that on me. Yeah. I mean, that, that, law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, law enforcement officers. What do we mean again? Just yeah. being redundant, not being redundant about it. Yeah. Is that they, they, people have to obey the law? You break yeah. the law. Yeah. So we got them to basically enforce the law, right? That's right. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. And good training. By the way, are they underpaid or overpaid? What do you think, in your estimation? Uh, I don't, kind of work? That, I don't think I don't think I don't think that they're underpaid. Okay. I think they're over supervised. Over supervised. Over supervised. Oh. Yeah, I don't think that they need as many supervisors as they have. Uh, I hate to say this, probably I'll regret it, but I've never figured out what a lieutenant does. <laughs> All the time well, I work. What's the ranking do? You know, you got sergeants, you got yeah, lieutenants, you got captains. Sergeants do captain, the work. You... Policemen do the work. Sergeants, sergeants supervise the officers. 
And the lieutenant stays in the office and does paperwork, I think. And now our present city uh, system for the city of Portland. They're over supervised. Okay. Do you think that do you think that uh, the chief of police should be elected by the people or should they be no. should it be the way it is right now? No. The chief of police should not be elected. He should he needs to come up through the ranks and be a member of the bureau. Uh, bringing in outside people for chiefs, I don't think has ever been a good idea. And again, the same thing with the with, the, with yeah. the mayor. They should hire the chief, right? They should hire the chief, okay, yeah. Okay, so we're going to work Multnomah good. Multnomah County Sheriff yes. is an elected official, that's and right. that's a different story. Okay. They're, di they're in charge of the jails and that sort of thing. Now, you ran I, for that position, didn't you? I did. I ran did for you, sheriff. Did you like it the way it was? <laughs> I would have changed it a lot. You would have changed it a lot. I would have changed it a lot, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, it okay, wouldn't yeah. look like a stopple either. Yeah, I got, got you. Yeah. I got you. Well, look, um, we're going to be spending more time on this subject. As sure. you know, uh, we're going to try to try to get, uh, get interviews with uh, Charlie Hill and, and Ted Wheeler, who's running for, they're running for mayor, if you will. Yeah. And we got two seats open for the city council right. aspect of it. So we need at least three votes, right? You do. Yeah, yeah you, you got me. And uh, naturally, we're going to be running for mayor, and you know we're going to yeah. be working together jointly on this particular okay. issue. And, uh, and in all due respect, folks, uh, the vote, and I'm talking to law enforcement officers, too, at this time, and the citizenry. It is an issue. We have a major divide, if you will, and we're going to face with it. And I want to thank Don, in all due respect, for spending as much time, because I didn't have that background material. Uh, he goes way back. He, is a, he was a former law enforcement officer, and, and, I mean, just taking this opportunity to do what he's done and, and to write a book like that, and in most cases, you think he'd be intimidated or, or challenged or, or this, this, that, and the other. But... Uh, but we need we need that, if you will, to get meshing together, if you will, of the citizenry and the people who are working in law enforcement. Right. That's a tough, tough, tough job. Yep. And uh, yes, we want to get to the point where we can protect their back, and they can, they, you know, I, they can, they, they got families and this, that, that, and the other. But the fact, I man, we got to divide. And and I'm really appreciative, Don, mm -hmm. of all the work that you've done, and Thank we're going to continue to do this, Pete. Right. The citizens need to know what to expect from the police, and the police need to know what to expect from the citizens. Good word. That's a good deal. Okay, folks. Well, thank you on that particular one. Don, thank you very much, buddy. Okay. You know we'll be in touch again, right? Yeah. Okay, bud. Okay, Cal, where are you? Come on down. Let's get him over here. We got Cal Henry. We got Cal Henry with us now. Uh, he's the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs. You've seen Cal before. If you don't know who Cal is, we're going to have, have him give us a brief. We got a we got a, got a good 15, 17 minutes, and Cal, why don't you just briefly let them know, one, uh, who you are and how long you've been uh, associated with the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs and why Black Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs. Boom. Go on. Uh, I've been associated yes, with the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs since it started in 1977. But uh, and who am I? Basically, I'm just a change agent. Former military too, by the uh, way. I am he also. Was a Marine, but he was a what, the Air Force. I was Air Force. Okay, well, he's and good. He's good. And, and I was good. also was in the Air National Guard. Air, Air National Guard. Yes. Okay, okay, you guys. Now are I paid my dues, and I expect others to pay theirs yes. in making some difference. Yes. As I was listening to the discussion by good. by Don a little bit, I remember the time when, as as president of the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs, we heard about a little young black student getting shot with the bean bag, uh, you, if you recall mm -hmm. that issue. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the, the ministers in Portland wanted to do something about what was happening. And the upshoot of that was that the law enforcement people in Portland want to march against the, the city government, mm. if you recall that aspect. Yeah, of. Yeah. I, I think what Don has, has brought out is, is, is a crucial issue about that. The Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs wrote the mayor and, and asked him about uh, who's running the city. Was who's it, the mayor at the time? You have any idea? I, 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 I was thinking about okay, it. No the, the, okay, no problem. Okay. But, but in a way, I didn't get no response back from him. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the upshoot of that is that people seem to think that the mayor and city government is not running the city to a large degree, but the police department is. And when I asked uh, young blacks in, the, uh, in Portland, who is responsible for the safety hmm. of black Americans in Portland? They immediately say the police, hmm. which isn't correct. Right, right, right. It, it, that is not correct. The police is just an instrument of, of the city government, the mayor and the city government, to provide safety to the people in, in, in the state. I'm sorry, I'm hitting it. Yeah, well, no uh, and and I, th I think it's important yeah. that people need to know about a lot of that aspect. And I think Don 
and the other end, the individual you had here talking about yeah, Paul yeah. because people need to understand what it's all about. And uh, uh, one of the things that I came here today to talk to you a little bit is that we've had a lot of discussion in uh, this state and across the nation about Black Lives Matter. Yeah, right. Give us an update. Uh, okay, and I just came to share with, uh, we, had, we had a meeting a, a week ago, and we talked a little bit about this. But I wanted to share with the people. Excuse me just for a second. Would, would you give us an opportunity to define? What, what, what would you think would be a definition of I, Black Lives I'm Matter? Go, I'm going to get to that. Gonna get that yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to be quickly about okay, it. All right. but, cause okay. I, because I, yeah. want, I want to deal with the point about what we are involved with in terms of dealing with the issues that face black Americans. And that is state sanction, discrimination against black Americans in the United States and in Oregon. And that, that is a discrimination established by laws, actions, and activities of the federal, state, and local government to deny opportunities, rights, and citizenship to black Americans. Now, many people think that's a harsh way of looking at it, but when we began to look how the Constitution started, the U.S. Constitution, we saw three-fifths of a person. When we looked at how the Oregon Constitution started, it said that no black or a mulatto could come into this state and live. Mm -hmm. And it went on to say that any person that allowed them to do that can also be punished by penal law. And that means white people. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times people don't want to understand that whole issue. And when you tell them that, they get upset about that. So uh, one of the things that, that the young people uh, across the nation are looking about is trying to expose the state sanctioned discrimination against individuals, against black individuals, and versus other people benefit by it too. And so uh, Black Lives Matter is a national movement that exposes state sanctioned discrimination against black Americans that benefits all the individuals in our society. And it also enlightens all Americans how they are affected by it. If you talk to many white people in this state or another and across the country, they think they're not affected by it, but they are affected. But by But many it. do still, though. Many participate and support uh, the Black Lives Matter. Yes. Oh, I'm going to get to that too. Okay. All you know, right. like, but see, Black Lives Matter is not against the police, okay. as some people want to think. It is to help people understand how this is happening and and preventing the city of preventing all citizens of this country from benefiting from the rights and privilege that this country provides. And some people think that uh, it's only one way. Now, my point, my point to, uh, to you and to the audience is that don't be fooled about the notion that you're not affected by what is happening to me as a black individual in this state or in this country. You are affected by it, but you also benefit from some of the things that others get out and and lose their life with, uh, on trying to make the society better than what it is, and uh, and one of the things that we are trying to do, OABA is trying to do, is try to develop a film that will show how blacks were treated in Oregon, which is another way of exposing some of the early works of Oregon and some that are still going on. If we get here and understand all this, maybe we can work together to make life better for everybody. But first of all, when people feel that they are not affected by some of this, they think they don't have a, a dog in the fight, but they do. Let me share a thought with you, why, when, I want you to continue on. Why has this been such a hard sell? I know you've been involved with Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs for a number of years, Cal. Why is this, I mean, I, I can remember interviewing you years back, and you've still got the same message. What, what's the, why aren't they getting the message? What's the problem? Well, what's the issue? It, the issue is fear. 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 Okay. Okay. Most people are scared to, to exercise their rights when they feel that, that the whole system is against them. Now, Don told you about the, the notion about how people, and also Phil talked about it in some way, how people are afraid to, to ex expose what is happening. You can't have justice unless people are willing to share what is going on and be willing to come come forth with it. But penalties are very much r rigid 
in terms of how it affects other individuals who don't want to get it. My simple word, it is fear. Mm, fear. It's fear. So if that was, if that's the word, if that's the problem with fears, knowing that I know you're a doc, you're, you're you're an educator, you're an educator also too, and then you you've had, actually had contracts with the Portland Public Schools. We're talking about here in here in the Portland metropolitan area, and we've talked about this once before about maybe some way of easing that and getting this uh, getting this to the table was actually putting it in the classroom. But you know, I know you've worked hard to try to get that done. Why why has that been a problem? Well, see. If, if I were to say what, what I should say is that the education system and the justice system are not, were not designed for black Americans. Okay. Now, pe people get upset with me when I say that, but it is true. Okay. When we go and see what is going on in the school system as, as to how we're training the next generation of individuals, we're not doing a good job of it. We're not helping these individuals understand that we have to work together to better our society and make it meaningful. And then when we come to the issue of, 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 of knowing what the laws are, we're not helping people understand how to, how to understand politics and process, get in to know who makes the laws and how to affect that as citizens. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, we don't uh, see that educational picture taking place. And then when you begin to see the other end of enforcing laws that may not be good for all people, then you find people willing to back away from that issue. Mm -hmm. And so you never get the end of, of, of making sure that the laws are adequately enforced and it's enforced rightfully for all the people. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, uh, and like I'm taking advantage of you now because, oh, because you, you've got quite a bit of background, you spent quite a bit of time in this area. So for the again, for the benefit of the audience out there, I want to make sure that uh, we take advantage of that piece. Now, there's another little confusion item. You know, we've gone through, 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 through years and lifetime, the various uh, naming, if you will, of the et various ethnic groups from the standpoint of today, black American and African American. I, you know, we got an African American in one sense, and we got a Black American. What's the difference? Can you can you share with us what is the difference? Well, if there's a certain animal. Well, see, somebody else is always trying to define okay. black people in this in this country. I used to term Black American to describe me for two reasons. One, I grew up in this country. I grew up in Texas, and I, I didn't grow up in Africa, and uh, so I, I don't view myself as an African American. But at the same time, I understand others who want to use that to sort of make it easy to uh, easy pill to, to swallow. Give me another example. I was in Salem the other day, and I met a black lady that was uh, in uh, in one of the fast food places, and she introduced herself to me as a a biracial person, meaning that she was half Mexican mm -hmm. and half African. Uh -oh. No, no, I, I, I didn't argue that question. No, I just, but, but I know, but I know what she's trying to say to me. Okay, okay. And I know it's safe for her to say those kinds of things. But, but when we get in and, and, and see what our people have gone through over the years, from mm -hmm. slavery, for this, uh, and mm -hmm. then from segregation, and discre uh, discrimination, and people who have lost their lives, my use of the term black American is making a con uh, contribution to those people who are willing to give their life so that my life would be better, mm -hmm. so that I can help all people. Mm -hmm. And I do help all people, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I know that people think that because I talk about it, that I shouldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to talk about it. Yes. Uh, we need to get our legislators, our uh, elected officials, and all these things deal with it. If we don't want to say what is really going on, just look what's going on in the national scene today. And it, it, it is, it, if we see where, what Congress is doing to the people by not fulfilling their roles of passing laws that would get people back to work and do the other thing because they can't, they do not like the idea that we have a black man in the White House. Just as simple as that. Okay. And, and, and we have to talk about it. I know other people don't want to talk about it, and they don't want to hear me talk about it. When people say that he has not done anything, it, I cringe because they are not really telling the truth. When I see what people have done to try to stop this individ individual from representing all the people in this country, and we out there uh, allow the press not to be the press. In my judgment, we don't have a free press anymore because they're now trying to 
put forth a certain kind of image so that the people won't get the, the truth. And that's sad. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a couple of things I, I want to bring up. Uh, we went through the African American, Black American aspect of it, but now that there's a now that we, as one would say, because of you, I'm I'm able to come up with my definition now. Okay. Because when you think about when you say African American, African Americans are not just black; they're also white too. I agree Am I right? with you. I agree so, with you. but Black Americans is, is Black Americans. You know, they're from here. Now, you know, we normally put all of the, the the other various ethnics, whether it be Irish or this, that, and the other, as White Americans, right? You got okay. it. So, so the bottom line: if you were born here, born and raised here, you either White American or Black American or whatever, but you're not. But I'm going back to the whole issue of being called African Americans. So I wanted to make sure that you, that definition was well, was well, shared with with the with the public across the board. And thanks to you, yeah, you, you, yeah, you well, opened my well, eyes. Here. Well, well, the, the whole the whole thing in this country, we have used political uh, definitions to to drive what what's going on in this country. When you and I grew up in Texas, yeah. basically there's two kinds of people: You're either black or white. Mm -hmm. But those are political definitions mm -hmm. to a large degree, mm. because it, if you look at it, they don't really match up. But we go back to look from the beginning of the country to now, those definitions hold true in the sense that people, most people come to this country, they want to be white Americans. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be black Americans. Mm -hmm. And so the hope, because they understand what this country has been built upon in a segregated way, to keep blacks in an inferior position and whites in a superior position. But you do agree. I agree e with you. Everybody's, oh, no, got, but everybody's got to eat. I don't see, disagree and with and you. Whoever pays me, that's where I'm going to go. Well, 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 well see, <laughs> but, but see, we got to be willing to to grow and I build agree. our country. I agree. Now, if, if, if we're going to, what you just said, you just verified to me how fear get into the picture. Yeah, about the food. But uh, and, and about money. money. About the but, money. But, but the, the whole point of it, we should be able to 30, achieve. About thirty seconds. Keep we should up. be able to achieve. We should be able to achieve a lot of things without having to be afraid to do it. Sounds great. And we need to encourage our elected officials to not it. to be afraid. Well, hey, as you can see, that's why we're going to have him on. He'll be on next week to give us another little little goodie, just like Don, because we got. It's going to take some work to get it, get these get these two subject matter so. So thank you very much well, for being with us. You're welcome. We appreciate that very much. And thanks for joining us. And by the way, and then th also thanking the guests also too. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week. You'll see Don and Cal, and we'll have another guest. Take care. Have a good one.